please welcome Atlantic Council President and CEO Frederick Kemp. Bitte begrüßen Sie Atlantic Council President and CEO Frederick Kemp. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2018 Atlantic Council Freedom Awards. Um, we gather here not only on the 10th anniversary of the Atlantic Council's Freedom Awards and our return to the city of Berlin where we launched these awards 10 years ago, which itself was the 20th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. But we're also here on the eve of another historic anniversary. Tomorrow marks the 70th anniversary of the, Berlin, of the beginning of the Soviet blockade of Berlin. The defining crisis of the first months of the Cold War. The Soviet Union blocked all access to areas of Berlin under Western control. I won't go into much detail here, you can look it up, it's a fascinating tale, but it came a few days after the introduction of the new Deutsche Mark. So everything in the end uh, also is economic and political and security. It was this crisis where the Soviet Union blocked all access to areas of Berlin under Western control that tested for the first time how far the Allies would go, how far the United States would go, the British would go, to protect the freedom of post-war West Germany and West Berlin. In response, over the course of the next 15 months, the Western Allies, in particular US and British militaries, came together in a Herculean effort to airlift in supplies each and every day to sustain West Berlin. General Lucius Clay, two days after the start of the blockade, gave the order to launch what he called Operation Vittles. On the following day, June 26, 32 C-47s carried 80 tons of cargo, including milk, flour, and medicine. General Clay told his betters in Washington that this would be a three-week operation to break the blockade. Over the course of the operation, which went from June to the next year, the Soviets only really gave up the blockade when they saw there was no surrendering on the Allies' part. So it went from June to the following May, and then the, the airlift itself lasted to the following September. So this three-week operation in the end went over a year, and Allied forces flew 200,000 flights and dropped 8,893 tons of supplies. One of the heroes of this airlift, U.S. Air Force Colonel Gail Hal Halverson, took on an unauthorized mission that became a subset of Operation Vittles. It became known as Operation Little Vittles. His was an effort to raise the morale of West Berliners in the simplest of ways. He had given some wriggly chewing gum to a couple of children in West Berlin and it was one piece and they broke it up into about 10 and then those that didn't get the piece were smelling the wrapper and he said, I see an opportunity here. And so uh, he said, I'm going to bring you more candy. And they said, well, how will I recognize you? And he said, I'll wiggle my wings as I come over Berlin. And so he did that via mini parachutes, American candy. Over time, he dropped 23 tons of candy to the citizens and the children of Berlin. Lots of it was donated by U.S. children once the word got out. 
and then by American manufacturers. Um, so uh, in the words of what we've been talking about the last couple of days, uh, if you had done hashtag candy bomber at that time, it would have gone viral. So tonight we have dropped a piece of candy on each of your plates, or a couple, as a nod to Colonel Halverson and a nod to the impact of one man or one woman's actions uh, who believe in freedom and what impact that action can have on a whole population and a nod to the bonds of our transatlantic community because I can promise you, had it not been for the Berlin airlift, there would not have been a NATO. There would not have been a reunification of Germany and we would not be sitting here tonight fighting new, uh, celebrating new freedom fighters. Uh, by the way, Colonel Halverson, uh, I have a soft spot for him because he was from Salt Lake City, Utah, and so am I. Um, but he did not have German heritage and so do I, and I do. And so for me, Berlin is a special place because when the wall went up, it didn't just divide the unfree and the free worlds. It didn't just divide East and West Germany. It divided our family. So for me, this city, city has global meaning and very, very local meaning. So it's incredibly fitting that on this anniversary and on our 10th anniversary of the Freedom Awards, we return to Berlin, a city that is the embodiment of the triumph of freedom and democracy. Our awards have always honored for those who fight for these principles. Many of you here spent the last two days at our 360 OS Open Source Summit. And in doing so, you joined our grassroots movement to harness the technologies that some would use to divide us, to bring us together and fight for truth in the digital space. So before we get going, I want you all from 360 OS to applaud yourselves. Thank you. What the last two days have underscored is the nature of the trials we face as a global community have shifted. And therefore, we have to refine our strategies to overcome these challenges. Old language, old solutions, old approaches won't cut it. And the impressive group of awardees that we honor tonight embody just that. They hail from different regions, industries, and different generations. But together, they exemplify the courage, passion, and dedication that is needed to build a global community fundamentally rooted in the fundamental causes of freedom, democracy, and human rights. All of the honorees you will meet tonight share a conviction that together we can overcome the greatest issues of our time, both globally and very locally. As they break down barriers and inspire others to do the same, these trailblazing women, excuse me, women and a girl, these trailblazing females uh, are redefining what freedom means to our generation and a new generation. That is why tonight we recognize Secretary Madeleine Albright for championing democracy and human rights for all and for un her unwavering devotion to building a secure and a prosperous world. Secretary Albright. And thank you so much for inspiring so many others, including me, including Damon Wilson, including all of us at the Atlantic Council. Um, not too far away from Secretary Albright is my newest best friend, Bana al -Abed, for her innovative use at nine years of age, and then she was eight, of social media to document the plight of Syrian children in war tone Aleppo, and for her awareness, drive, and maturity well beyond her years. Bana. My own 10-year-old daughter would be crashing at this time, so thank you so much. Um, uh, 
Secretary Albright, Bana, in all of our Freedom Awards over the last 10 years, this is the biggest gap of generation that we've had. Uh, but, I, but I must say, you inspire me about the future, and Secretary Albright inspires us that a lifetime led in, on behalf of freedom is a lifetime well spent. Uh, third, the International Women's Media Foundation for building press freedom from the ground up by supporting the critical work of women journalists understanding that freedom is threatened not just by conflict or direct oppression, but also by apathy and lack of opportunity. So please applaud the International Women's Media Foundation. And finally, pop star Ariana Saeed for selflessly using her musical talents to bring people together, to support women and girls in Afghanistan, and to stand up for injustice. Uh, to become a star of such talent and be so recognized is a hard thing to do in any country in the world. Uh, it is uh, an almost impossible thing to do in Afghanistan, and so many people in so many places the world are inspired by you, by you. so it will be an honor for us to honor you as well. This impressive representation, all of them female leaders, you can also be a leader at age nine, illustrates the power of the individual in the face of a spectrum of challenges, some newly emerged, others echoes of the past. The call is to act as a community and to take decisive action, and it could not be louder. And the message of the Berlin Airlift is what is the cost of not doing so? Tonight's honorees all answered that call, and for that we take this moment to pause and celebrate their actions tonight and their impact in the world. It must be said, of course, that this pause, sadly, does not apply to the World Cup. So rest assured, we will be streaming tonight's match during our dinner break and even after the close of the program. Um, uh, if you really are virulently in favor of Germany winning this match, uh, and uh, uh, you know, the former Prime Minister of Sweden, Carl Bildt, is here in the front row, and, and he probably would like to have a conversation with you. Uh, <laughs> Which brings me to a few words of gratitude. We at the Council are also stronger as a community, working hand in hand with our partners. There are too many here we're working with tonight to name you all. But I would like to thank our Freedom Award supporters without which we would not be here. The Foreign and Commonwealth Office of the United Kingdom, Facebook, Twitter, Microsoft, Ambassador Rockwell A. Schnabel, and Ambassador Victor Ash, thank you so much for making this evening and these last two days uh, possible. Um, and finally, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to the former Freedom Award honorees in this audience uh, this evening. Um, Ambassador, and maybe you can stand so people can see where you are. Ambassador Dan Freed, Ambassador Jerzy Kosminski, and former Prime Minister of Sweden, Carl Bildt. Um, I encourage you to engage in social media with this incredible community uh, using the hashtag and also those not in the room. I think we're streaming this. If we're not, start. Uh, 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 using the hashtag, hashtag AC Awards. Uh, so thank you for joining us, and with that, it's my honor to welcome to the stage, and I want to say a couple of things about him, the former Freedom Awardee, Horst Telchik, a personal friend, someone who's on the front lines of freedom throughout his impressive career, playing an instrumental role in German reunification. Um, I won't tell you one story, I will tell you another. So uh, I worked for the Wall Street Journal for many years, and he was a source, and I won't tell you those stories. Um, but thank you, Horst, for talking to me during that period of time. The second I will tell you, which is after the fall of the Berlin Wall, might have been around middle of November, going on November 19th or so, um, 
he met with uh, the chancellor, Helmut Kohl, and they were talking about what they should do next. And, and Horst Selchuk, being a person who understands the sweep of history and when to take a moment uh, to grab uh, the chance, said to the chancellor, I think it's time to tell the German people and tell the world that we're all in for German unification and we're going for it. Uh, there was no consultation with the US at that point, with the British, with the French, on the fact that he was going to do that. Uh, and they even kept it a secret from the foreign minister of that time, Hans Dietrich Genscher, but that's another book. Um, Chancellor Cole said, go ahead, write the speech. Join me in welcoming Horst Telchik to the stage for all he's done over his lifetime for freedom and democracy. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Secretary Albright, uh, Your Excellencies. First of all, uh, I was told to ask you to start eating. <laughs> well, uh, Fred, thank you for the kind introduction. Well, back in 2016, when I last stood on the Freedom Awards stage in Wroclaw, in Breslau, the tone was optimistic. As I stand before you now in 2018, some might say we are living in unprecedented times. The United States and the countries of Europe seem to be no longer united. Immigration, trade, energy, populism, even defense, these are just a handful of the issues that divide us. Many of you in the audience may be too young to remember the events surrounding the end of the Cold War and the fall of the Berlin Wall. For those of you who do recall you know that the process of reunification was never guaranteed. It took mutual respect, mutual trust, commitment, and a keen acknowledgement of the historic moment. Back then, we came together as a global community, working hand in hand to ensure a peaceful, reconciliation and build a better world. May I just remind you of the Charter of Paris for a new Europe from Vancouver to Vladivostok, signed by all 35 presidents and heads of governments of the CSCE countries in November 1990. What a vision but who really took care of it. The United States was one of Germany's greatest partners in all these efforts. The challenges we face today may be unprecedented and they are certainly concerning, but they are not insurmountable. It is often difficult without hindsight to comprehend the complexity and the magnitude of the moments in which we live. I speak from experience. But make no mistake, just as we overcame great trials before, we can and will do it again. Now is not the time to build walls. We did just that half a century ago, the consequences of which still reverberate today. No, now is the time to tear down our walls and to overcome the difficulties. Which is why I'm delighted to be part of tonight's celebration the work of the awardees, 
we will honor this evening is absolutely vital to defending freedom in our world. Thank you for being here. Thank you for honoring these individuals. And most importantly, thank you all for doing your own small part to ensure that the challenges we face today do not defeat us. It is now my honor to formally start the program. I ask you to please turn your attention to the video screen behind me as we honor Secretary Madeleine Albright. Thanks a lot. Please welcome His Excellency Karl Bildt, former Prime Minister of Sweden. Bitte begrüßen Sie seine Exzellenz Karl Bildt, ehemaliger Premierminister Schwedens. Madam Secretary Madeleine, I wasn't aware of that thing with the drums, but um, I hope we can get some elaboration on the background to that. Um, I can also before some remarks on Madam Secretary Madeleine announced that it's still zero zero um, and don't expect me to be very much more in terms of guidance on football. I'm well known in my country for being fairly uh, less expert, let's put it like that, on these issues. There was an instance when I was, I was Prime Minister at the time and uh, there was a World Championship in football going on and the media came up to me, and the media, they always have their sort of devious plots, so they asked me whom I thought was going to win. And being Prime Minister of Sweden, I thought that I could only say I expect Sweden to win. And I thought that was a fairly good answer from the political point of view. It only turned out that Sweden wasn't playing <laughs> that year. And uh, those things do happen. I'm deeply honored to be asked to say a couple of words of the Freedom Award nominee, Madeleine Albright. Madeleine, if I'm allowed to say that, I am, is in my opinion a girl from and of Europe. From and of. From, obviously, born in Prague, then Czechoslovakia, before the war. And um, her family and herself 
forced to flee from that Czechoslovakia when Hitler took over. But then, of course, Hitler was defeated. There was a new hope for Europe. They could return to their Prague, but then had to flee again in 1948, when Stalinism descended upon half that half of Europe. And then the family in Madeline ended up via Ellis Island, the Statue of Liberty in the United States. And that became, of course, the scene of her astonishing public career over the decades that followed. Started as an academic career, not very well known, political scientists devoting her studies also to what happened in her native Czechoslovakia. But then, through her academic credentials, being dragged into, dragged into public policy, foreign policy, working under Spigny Brzezinski, born not in Prague, but born in, born in Warsaw, working under Spigny Brzezinski in the National Security Council under President Carter. But then, of course, became much more of a household name for all of us and acquired public prominence when she became the ambassador or to, of the United States to the United Nations in 1993 under President Clinton with, if I remember, cabinet rank. So there are ambassadors and ambassadors, but then there are ambassadors with cabinet rank and Madeleine was among those. And 1993 was um, a period of, let's remember that, profound hope. The Soviet Union had disappeared. Russia had embarked on a course of profound economic and political and democratic reforms. We were all engaged with and hopeful for the new Russia that emerged. Germany had reunified and started its new course. Poland was free. So was Czechoslovakia, but the Balkan area, the former Yugoslavia, was in flames. So it was a period of profound hope and possibilities, but also significant and difficult challenges in terms of where our Europe was heading. And Madeleine was, of course, in her position at the United Nations, deeply involved with all of this. In 1997, she was appointed Secretary of State. There have been uh, very many Secretary of States in the history of the United States, I would assume, but she was the very first woman in that particular position and became the highest position woman in the United States federal government ever at that particular time. And that was also a time of um, challenges and possibilities. Just mention one thing that happened, and that was that what was then the Czech Republic was admitted into NATO. So the girl from Prague, who had been forced to flee that city from first Nazism, fascism, and then communism, was enabled to be instrumental in bringing that country into the community of free Atlantic nations. He stepped down as Secretary of State 17 years ago. That's a fairly long time ago. And a lot of public officials, as we know, they step down and then they write a book or two and that's roughly it, not Madeleine. Madeleine belongs to those rather rare individuals which I believe have been even more powerful after leaving office than when in office. Not having the power of the office, that's gone, but the power of ideas and the powers of conviction and the powers of inspiration. And that, in a sense, is over time far more powerful than any office in itself.
can bring. Her commitment to and her work for the different causes are well known. Starting with women or girls, and I think it is appropriate that Madeline is honored here together with a number of other Fred girls, um, because she has been a force for the empowerment of women in whatever positions they have all over the world during those, all of these years. Her work for freedom and democracy is of course what is perhaps what she is most well known for. Her leadership of the National Democratic Institute is perhaps the thing that one has heard, which has been her perhaps most important platform over these particular years, because that has made it possible for her voice to be heard all over the world for freedom and democracy. And we've seen that also in the last few months with her new book about fascism, a warning, a bestseller, I understand, on so far the other side of Atlantic, hopefully on this side of the Atlantic as well. And then also, third should be mentioned, for refugees. Whenever, wherever, coming from a very personal experience. So she has inspired many multitudes on continents and throughout Europe, even more after having left office than she, when she was in office. And that, I think, is quite an achievement. I particularly remember, I think it was in December 2011, when uh, we both, but primarily Madeleine, I'd say, went to the funeral in Prague of Václav Havel, who was, of course, uh, one of the absolutely leading lights of democracy and human rights in our part of the world. And uh, Madeleine was among the few that was invited to speak in the cathedral and spoke, of course, in Czech. I didn't understand what she said, but it was deeply moving and deeply important, and that was fairly obvious. I think it's highly appropriate that uh, Madeline gets the Freedom Award. And I think it's also very symbolic that it happens in the city of Berlin, that this girl from and of Europe gets the award in this city. This city of Berlin where Nazism was defeated, where communism collapsed, and where Europe started to come together again, and where US leadership over the decades has been so profoundly important. So with these words, I just want to profoundly congratulate and uh, ask Madeline, perhaps, to come and receive the award. Thank you very much, Prime Minister Bilt, or Carl, if I may, uh, for those very kind words and for your friendship and for your immense contributions in the Balkans. Um, we did a lot of things together, and your role was just incredibly important and central to what happened and what continues to be a very important part of the world. And also for your dedication to the cause of freedom. Um, and it has been my pleasure and honor to keep our friendship going over the years and to intersect at various important 
uh, conferences and just to make sure that those of us that have cared about what happens in Europe and around the world continue to speak out. Um, I want to commend tonight's other honorees and let me just say that I'm very pleased to be with this incredible girls team. Um, and also, the things that you have done are the things that I wanted to do. So, Ariana Saeed, um, I have always wanted to sing. Um, and so, uh, I'm delighted to be on the stage with you. Um, and to Elisa Lis Munoz, who is representing the International Women's Media Foundation, I had wanted to be a journalist. And I actually was a little girl. So, we have... <laughs> a lot in common and I'm delighted to be up here with the girls team and I want to thank all of you for what you have done and will yet to do on behalf of the values we all cherish. I can tell you about the drums actually. Um, what happened was that I uh, was at the Kennedy Center with Chris Bodie who plays the trumpet and we went down to see him ahead of uh, the, his show and he actually said, sometimes when I have somebody in the audience that has a name, I ask them to come and play drums with me. Uh, will you play drums with me? And I said, sure, I've never played drums before, but I did it. Um, I've done it now a number of times, and my nickname is Styx. Uh, so there's always time for a different career. Um, I also want very much to thank the Atlantic Council because it does in fact represent so many of the values that we all cherish. And I think for me, as Carl mentioned, I find myself as somebody who is dedicated to the European-American relationship and the importance of that relationship always being renewed. And the Atlantic Council is doing an incredible job. And for as long as I can remember, this organization has preached the gospel of international engagement on behalf of freedom, prosperity, and law. In recent years, the Council has acted with renewed vigor and purpose, and this is testament to the boundless energy of Fred Kemp um, and the wisdom of many on the board and many of the members who are here this evening. Council supporters understand the value of the transatlantic partnership um, and him, not only how important it is, to those in Europe and the United States, but to people everywhere. And they also know that the values which underpin this history um, and this history changing friendship are being challenged from inside and out. As the little girl in Czechoslovakia, and by the way, the picture of me in my national costume was when I was about your age. Um, I always said, my father was the ambassador and I'm the little girl that, whose job it was to give flowers at the airport. That was what I did for a living at that time. Um, and as a little girl in Czechoslovakia, I saw what happens when good and decent people fail to unite in the face of threats to freedom. And it disturbs me greatly to hear echoes and see shadows of that era in our day. Now as then, there are politicians who propagate conspiracy theories designed to nurture hate and fear among average citizens who encourage followers to lash out at people who differ from themselves and who promise simple solutions to hard problems through the repression and degradation of others. Now as then, there are leaders who seek to monopolize authority by rewriting constitutions, co-opting the courts, weakening legislatures, and equating dissent with treason. Now as then, there are leaders who want us to believe that greatness is defined by spectacle, not character, that honor is irrelevant, and that winning means not having to answer any questions. We are gathered this evening in a city that was once decimated and divided, but now reborn into a capital at the heart of a new Europe. This history is a reminder that we cannot afford to be complacent. We have to draw a line between legitimate debate and efforts to augment power by chipping away at the foundations of democracy. Carl mentioned I have a new book. It has a very bland title, Fascism, A Warning. It has a very kind and uh, bland cover, red and black. Um, and it is, um, I have been told that it's alarming. It's supposed to be alarming. 
In the United States, we have a slogan that has been drilled into us in relation to the fight against terror. If we see something, such as an unattended suitcase or a backpack, we should say something. Well, I've added a third element to the slogan. See something, say something, and what I've added is do something. And that is why I have issued a warning in my new book. And that is why I say tonight that there is an urgent need for people on both sides of the Atlantic to stand together and vow that we will not allow the peddlers of hate to shape our future. We will not allow them to turn us against one another or to treat our neighbors with contempt. We will not allow them to hijack the institutions that ensure our freedom and define our democracies. We will not abandon all that have gained through dex from decades of shared sacrifice. We will not accept the idea that we should simply go home and sleep, ignoring the gathering threats to peace. We will not remain silent as they strive to drain the meaning from words and to convince us that up is down and wrong is right and truth is whatever they claim it to be. Instead, in every country, from all parts of the political spectrum, we have to insist on the integrity of our own minds, the importance of democratic values, the rights of the majority and minorities, and the dignity of every human being. Because with those beliefs behind us, and with those belief as our support, I'm convinced that there's no threat before us against which we cannot prevail if we heed the warning, if we act in time, and if we learn from our other honorees tonight. I don't think there's been a speech or a book written in the United States that doesn't quote Robert Frost. And I'm doing the same thing, because what he wrote was, now that I'm old, my teachers are the young. And that could not be truer than this evening, because I can still be inspired when I see children like Bana coming together to demand the right to live in peace and freedom. We have a lot to learn from her. The cynics will tell you that there's nothing to be done about the crisis we find ourselves in today. But as Nelson Mandela said, everything is impossible until you do it. It is in that spirit of determination and solidarity that I accept this award tonight. I am deeply, deeply honored, and it is with gratitude and affection that I thank you again for honoring me this evening. This means a great deal to me from this organization in this incredible city. Thank you very much.
please welcome Bellingcat analyst and 2018 European Press Prize finalist Nick Waters. Bitte begrüßen Sie Nick Waters, Bellingcat Analyst und Finalist des 2018 Europäischen Pressepreises. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Secretary Albright as well. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar uh, with the story uh, of Barna and Fatima uh, Alabed. Um, who used social media to document uh, their experience of living uh, through the siege of East Aleppo. The effort by uh, Fatima and Barna to use social media uh, to show the world what was happening uh, from the perspective of their family humanized the unimaginably vast suffering of civilians uh, within Syria. When we were asked to examine um, the social media presence of Barna, uh, we were initially uh, skeptical, um, since there have been incidents where this kind of thing has been faked before. However, under the scrutiny, um, every single inconsistency uh, fell apart. So the idea that there was no electricity, for example, was quite easily solved by the images and videos of solar panels and car batteries um, on the roof of the flat where they lived. Uh, the idea that there was no uh, mobile signal, cell phone signal, um, was quite easily dismissed by the, the Syrian regime itself, uh, who has sent threatening text messages to uh, the population of East Aleppo. And finally, using the images and the videos uh, that Barna and Fatima had posted themselves, we could geolocate uh, their location uh, to the neighborhood in East Aleppo, uh, to the exact flat and floor in which they lived. However, this posed a bit of an ethical conflict because this kind of level of information was dangerous. If we'd have posted it uh, without assessing what we were doing, uh, we could have put the Alabed family in danger. So we held back and we waited, and we waited until finally uh, we found out that the Alabed family had been, or their flat, had been bombed, sending, or meaning that they had to escape uh, into East Aleppo as the, uh, the rebel held pocket collapsed. At this point, we decided to publish our findings um, in the hope uh, of showing that Barna and Fatima uh, were real and they were a real family in very real danger. And it was an incredible relief to see them uh, several days later uh, safe outside uh, of the East Aleppo pocket. Since then, Barna has written a book and achieved absolutely extraordinary things um, as a very young girl. And it gives me great pleasure uh, to award Barna uh, on behalf of the Atlanta Council, uh, the Freedom Award. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor to be here with all of you today in, at, in the evening. I want to thank all of you for coming to here. I want to thank the Atlantic Council for giving me this award. I'm so happy for standing up in front of you all. I came to here to share my story just 16 months ago. Me and my family were living in Aleppo under siege and bombing. I was afraid to die, but my biggest fear that one of my brothers will die. I am happy we are all alive today. One day without bombing in, in Syria, Aleppo, 
would make me the happiest person in the world because I hate war. It destroyed all I had. It killed my friends. We lived under siege and bombing. I want to share my story so the world know how the life. I asked my mom to help me sharing our story on Twitter so the world can know what is happening there and to help us to stop the war. I have many friends on Twitter. I love them. They give me support. They always text me. My friend J.K. Rowling, she is kind to us. She gave to me Harry Potter books. We shared our story as the war go on. It was dangerous. There was two days of big bombing and none stopping. The third day, a bump came and hit our lovely home. We went down and immediately go out. We run away from our lovely home. Before we get out of Aleppo, me and my family were going from a place to another to search for some food and some water. Everyone was running. It was mad. I could see my brothers sad. They were tired. They just want peace. Children of Syria are tired of war. Getting out of Aleppo was my happiest day. There was no bombing, no more war planes. I was like dreaming. I miss the days without bombing. I'm lucky I am alive. But I must say to all the leaders around the world, they are not helping enough to stop the war and to help the children. Many children are dying. There will be many refugees. If you want for your children and the world to have a better future, the leaders of the world must stand together to stop the war and help the children to have education. I believe the people can help to stop the war. I hope the young people can help to make the world better again. Thank you all for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, please enjoy your dinner. The second half of the program will begin shortly. We will now switch to the Germany-Sweden World Cup game. <laughs> 